I messed with something I shouldn't have and now it's ruining my life. By Baba Yaga. I can't remember exactly when everything started to happen. I guess it would have begun sometime around the camping trip if I really had to pinpoint it. Camping has always been a tradition for my mates and me. Since we first became friends, we've set some time once a month to head up to our favorite spot, camp, drink, and have a total blast. The drive up was pretty standard. We were all stoked to be back. I noticed something strange when I finally turned on the driveway to our spot. There were a variety of dead animals littering the ground. I know, it's cliche, and we should have definitely left immediately, but we are very critical of our memories. Would you stop doing something that you looked forward to every single month over some dead animals in a forest? And the weirdest part was that there wasn't a single sound in the woods. Not a single bird or chime of a bug. No wind either. It was like the whole place was dead or something. I'm not stupid, or at least I thought I wasn't. When the forest is silent like this, it only means one thing. There's a predator that's lurking around. I called my colleagues who were behind and told them the situation. Once again, we loved camping, so it was a no-brainer to continue our tradition. But as a precaution, we agreed to keep our guns on our persons. We finally arrived at the site, and we were dumbfounded. The place was absolutely trashed. Ripped up paper, plastic was everywhere. Clothing as well. And in the dead middle was this weird, like, shrine. There were burned candles placed all around the ground around this log, and on this log sat this mid-sized statue. Next to the sculpture were four handmade creepy dream catchers. It was like someone was out here worshipping this thing. I was beyond mad. This was our property someone had messed with, and we had lived our whole life growing up here. No, I, I was not letting someone trash this place and put this stupid thing here. I picked up a thick branch and smashed it into bits. I grabbed all the trash, I put it into a pile, and lit that crap all on fire. Right when the fire was lit, I noticed the forest went back to its busy noises. The birds were chirping, and the bugs were making their normal noise. Even the wind was back. Later that night, we forgot about the creepy shrine and the trash. We were midway through our beers and s'mores when we heard a loud metallic scratching noise coming from where our cars were parked. Right after that, all of our car alarms went off. We loaded our rifles and went to check them out. All of our tires were slashed, if you can call them tires at this point. They were ripped so severely that it was just a mess of rubber. There were also deep slashes on the sides of the trucks. And then the forest went quiet again. We luckily had enough service to contact the ranger's office. During the call, there was a rustle to our left. With the combined anxiety and beer, we didn't take a chance. Each of us fired off six bullets. Any bear or big cat would have run off at the very least. This thing was still moving around. Bro, what is that? I asked. A second later, I heard my voice coming from where we shot at. Bro, what is that? We all looked at each other in terror. It sounded like me, but it was different. How is this possible? My voice came from the forest, but I was standing by the trucks with my friends. That's impossible. This thing kept repeating the things I had spoken all night in my authentic voice with that slight distortion. We didn't care about the trucks as we all ran down the driveway. A couple of minutes later, and the forest noise was back. We were in the clear. I had never been so happy to hear a cricket in my life. We later ran into some rangers, and we got a lift home. Of course, we didn't mention the voice, but we told them about the animal and what it did to our car. They told us it was likely a massive, ticked-off bear. <laughs> if only they knew. A couple of days later, some quote-unquote stuff started happening. Knocks at my doors and windows at odd hours of nights persisted for about a week. Normal, right? I mean... Probably a bunch of teenagers playing a dumb prank or something. I put this to the back of my head and reassured myself that they would eventually get bored. A couple of days later, I threw the idea entirely out the window. Covering the ground was a mixture of dead animals. What the heck? I thought. No teenager would take it this far. I knew whatever that thing from the mountain was had followed me home. I went out and purchased a camera system and hooked it up. That night, I sat in my living room holding my rifle, acting as if it would do anything at all. 
I heard a hard knock at the door. When I looked out, I saw a figure standing on the pathway. It was hard to see as it was dark outside, but I knew it was that thing from the mountain. In the same voice, it called out to me. Hey, could you open the door? It's freezing out here. What the heck? What is this and what does it want? Get the hell away from me! I yelled. Get the hell away from me! It answered back, again my voice, but much more distorted. I can't even lie. All of my courage drained at that moment. I'm not scared to admit it. I was crying as I phoned the police. By the time the police arrived, it was of course gone. Luckily, I still had the camera though. I gave them the footage and they said they would look into it. In the following weeks, I noticed that things had started to follow me. Out of the corner of my eye, I would catch a figure wearing a hood and as soon as I turned my head to look at it, it would disappear like it was never there. I know I was not imagining it, and I also knew I wouldn't hide for much longer as it was starting to get bold and I was right. One night I was walking to my car and as I was about to get in, I was pushed hard to the ground. Looking down at me, in the same voice it calmly said, Let's see how far we take this game. Wait, please, I said in fear. Leave me alone, I didn't mean to mess with you. We're just getting started. It whispered back to me. When it took off its hood, I couldn't believe it. It, it was me. It looked exactly like me. Same eyes and mouth and the same scar on my left cheek and the same hair. It was like I was looking into a mirror. And to top it off, it already had my voice. I'll see you around. It said as it gave me a wink and walked away. The next day, I knew something was wrong when I woke up to see more than 100 notifications on my phone. This thing had made videos with my full name saying awful things, racial slurs, and how I was going to shoot up buildings. Videos of me saying I hated my family and how I wanted to kill all of my friends and much more. Remember, it looked and sounded exactly like me and used my real name. It seemed that only I was the one that would hear the distortion in the voice. All the notifications were from my family and friends outraged at what this thing had said, thinking it was me. I liked this girl and we had seen each other for a while. She stated I had done and said some very disgusting and hateful things about her all morning and that we were done together. What was I even supposed to say? Something has taken my face and voice and is ruining my life. Later in the day, I received a text from my bank, not social media, that my transactions was complete. No freaking way, I whispered. It had emptied my entire bank account. I quickly called and told them I did not make this transaction, but they said I had walked in and done it. While on the phone in the bank, I heard some commotion outside. I looked outside the window, expecting to see the figure I had grown to hate. What seemed to be the whole police force surrounded my house with their guns drawn. I was instructed to step out slowly and lay on the ground with my hands on my head, and I was arrested on the spot. I was told I was being charged with the robbery and three murder charges. It took a little for the details to come out. But they said I walked into a store, robbed it, and shot up the store before fleeing. Three people were killed and four people were in critical condition. I told my lawyer that I didn't own that type of firearm and they made a mistake. He told me they found the money from the bank transaction in the stolen amount. Plus, the gun used in the crime was stashed in my shed. I told him about the dead animals. That's not normal, I asked. Is it? They all had knife marks on their body, he answered. And guess what they found in your trash can? a knife matching the animal's blood. What about my friends? I asked. They were all there. They were all brought in for questioning. He said with a cold-faced tone, and they said some very bad things. I was practically falling out of my chair at this point. They said no voices came from the woods and that it was just a big bear. No, 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 we all heard it. What about the cameras? I screamed. I gave the cameras to the police and it would show the figure. My lawyer shook his head. From our view, there was no one in sight, plus the cameras picked up no sound. My lawyer told me I was screwed and three witnesses saw my face. What was posted on social media that morning didn't help me either. On the first day of court, I was immediately charged with grand robbery, three accounts of murder, and four accounts of attempted murder, with more charges on the side. I was given five life sentences and no chance of parole. I had to be isolated because of my so-called dangerous behavior and was forced to talk to a psychiatrist. She of course told me it was all in my head. She tried to force me to believe that there was no shape-shifting creature that had ruined my life, and I had a bad mental breakdown. She said it was normal behavior to blame someone else for what I had done. I don't know who to trust. I think the psychiatrist is the shapeshifter and is trying to ruin my mental mind. It probably messed with my friends too, because we all heard the voices. They can't lie to me anymore. 
I'm staring at the makeshift noose I tied as I type this. I'm done with the pain this thing caused me. In only a couple of weeks, this thing has ruined any relationship I had with my friends and family, emptied all my funds, and managed to commit a crime and blame it all on me. I'm not giving this thing the fun and satisfaction of its continuous attempts to ruin me. Camping in the Superstition by Anonymous I'm a 17-year-old guy currently living in Phoenix, Arizona. This incident occurred six months ago on an overnight trip in the Superstition Mountains, about an hour's drive east of Phoenix. I'm not going to specify the exact trail because I've been doing this stuff long enough to realize what happens when you post things on the internet. Whether it's a golf course, an abandoned mine, ghost, or whatever it may be, People usually come flocking with a lot of trash and loud music. I took this trail, an 8 mile loop through a canyon, a simple in and out overnight trip. I had planned to go with my friend, but the last minute cancellation on his part left me on my own. So with a packed bag and a car ready to go, I decided to go independently. Not leaving the house on time and having some trouble navigating through rough forest roads, I didn't arrive at the trailhead until around 5.45 which for those of you who don't backpack is a huge no-no. I had about a four mile hike until I arrived at my planned camping spot and it was getting dark fast. So I figured if I moved quick enough, I could get at least two to three miles in before I had to find the spot. This strategy left me hiking a very dark trail on my own with about 15 miles of dirt road between me and anyone else. Walking in the dark by itself is scary, especially for where I was and being on my own. Eventually, it got so dark that I could only see where my headlamp was pointing, and that's when I figured I needed to stop and set up a camp. Only using the headlamp as a light source, I tried to move as fast and as quickly as I could. I ended up in a less than ideal spot, but there were some burnt pieces of wood in the remains of a fire circle. Hence, it did look like people at one point camped here, but not any time recently from my estimations. My priority was to get the fire going. I scanned the area around me and found some dry wood and I got the fire going relatively easily. I got my tarp set up and cracked open a can of chili mac I had brought and was looking forward to eating. I felt good. My camp was set up and my food was on fire. The uneasiness from the hike had almost gone away and the concern from the walk in had virtually gone away. But it was still there in the back of my head, which I think is just a side effect from camping alone in remote areas. To fully understand what happened, I have to explain how my camp was set up. The site I had picked was a small clearing surrounded by large pine trees with a trail about 30 feet to my left. When you are in the woods and you have a fire going, the fire casts a circle of light around it and everything on the edge of that circle and past it is essentially pitch black. I was sitting on the ground near my fire eating dinner when a small rock about the size of a marble was thrown into my camp. I look at the tiny rock in shock as I was positive that I was the only person on this trail that night. I immediately turned my light on and towards the area where I had seen the rock come from, but due to the density of the pines and brush, I could only see about 10 feet ahead of me. I spent the next 15 minutes in disbelief as I scanned the tree line that surrounded me searching for whatever or whoever had thrown that rock, not daring to stray away from the fire that, in hindsight, offered me a false sense of security. After sitting down and spending the rest of my time on high alert, I convinced myself that I had somehow kicked the rock or had fallen from a tree. I went to sleep that night not expecting the pure terror that would unfold. I awoke to the sound of rustling leaves, barely inaudible if you weren't listening for them, but they were there. Still in a sleepy daze, I heard the rustling of those leaves, harder to hear as I assumed they were moving away from me. I went to grab the handheld flashlight I left next to me when I fell asleep, but the more I looked, the more scared I got as I realized it was no longer there. I stood up in my sleeping bag, ducked out of my tarp, and looked around. I could see the light off in the woods. It could not have been more than 15 feet away. It was my flashlight lying on the ground in a pile of leaves. This is one of the few moments in my life where I have almost crapped myself right then and there. The flashlight I had left sitting right next to me when I fell asleep a few hours ago was now 15 feet away from me past the tree line in the woods. I hurriedly slipped on my boots, clutching my knife the entire time in my other hand and keeping my head on a swivel. I weighed my options. 
Staying here and waiting the night out, or attempting the three mile hike back to the car in the pitch dark. I figured that whatever or whoever was out here with me was going to have a better advantage on sneaking up on me if I was out on the trail without a light. So I decided to stay at the camp and wait it out. Eventually it came back and I could hear it walking through the woods. It was far off but I could listen to it just barely. It sounded like someone leisurely walking by, like they were on a stroll without a care. Sometimes, it would wander too far away and I would lose the sound of its steps, but then an hour later, maybe two, it would return, still faint as ever. This continued for three or four hours until I listened to the steps getting closer and closer until they finally were about five to ten feet from me. The fire had been tiny as I had run out of wood in my stockpile. Finally, the footsteps stopped and everything went silent. I sat there for two hours, clutching a knife in my hand and praying for two hours, taking the knife in my hand and praying that I couldn't hear anything else. I stayed like that until the sun illuminated me to see that I was alone at my campsite. I packed my things up immediately and sped walk out of there. I don't think I have ever taken down a three mile hike that fast in my life. Finally I arrived at the empty dirt road where my car was parked and nearly sprinted to it as I unlocked my Subaru, jumped in and drove. I didn't stop until I had put at least 20 miles between me and that place. I stopped at a gas station in Apache Junction to buy a Red Bull, but mostly to see and talk to another person. As I exited the store, I read what was written in the dust on the back of my window. Sleep well? Many weird things have happened to me on my various adventures through Arizona, but this is the most mysterious and quite frankly scariest, so I thought I'd share it. There is a seriously deranged person living in the Superstition Mountain. Do yourself a favor and stay as far away from those mountains as possible. We encountered something weird while camping. By Colton. Howdy Swamp, it's Colton, and I've come today to share my cryptid encounter. I believe my cousin and I got extremely close to a cryptid known as a crawler. For a long time, my cousin and I, whom I'll refer to as Evan, had no idea what we saw, but we are 110% positive we saw something. We were camping with our families when our dads, my dad, and uncle said we should go for a snipe hunt. Now, a few of you should understand that this is a relatively old practical joke for kids. Pretending to catch a bird called a snipe often results in someone jumping into a cow pie after someone makes them think there's a bird there. Evan and I were like six to nine, somewhere around that age range. We were fairly young, so we went along excitedly, even though Evan did despite not being a very outdoorsy person. Our dads took us out into the woods, not far from the camp, but a little ways away. Then we curled up in a bush and waited. Our dads left us with that light and told us not to move until they came with the bird, and then we'd jump out and catch it. We sat perfectly still, not even whispering because we were that excited. Then suddenly, something landed right beside our bush. Evan whispered. What was that? I cut him off with a finger to my lips and motioned to my ear to listen. At that moment, we heard something coming from the bush. No noticeable patterns to the steps. I just knew it wasn't a person. After sitting there for just a second, I heard it get so close I swear I heard it breathing. My cousin and I held our breath, not trying to make a sound at all. I strained my eyes to see anything through the dark, then through the leaves of the bush. The moonlight revealed a white mass walking around the bush. It was circling us. I grabbed my cousin's shoulder and tensed up, ready to run. Just then it bolted away and I saw the lights of the flashlights and heard my dad's voice. I breathed deeply, sighed in relief, and waited and freaked out when they returned to us. Of course, with no bird. At first, my cousin and I just said that a bobcat or a raccoon was coming too close to us, but now I'm not as sure. The white skin, the speed, the circling. It may not have been hunting us, but if it were, this story would have probably ended differently. But it was definitely curious. I don't know. What do you all think in the comments below? Turongo Falls Camping Horror by Taj I went on a camping trip to Turongo Falls, Victoria, Australia. Now, a quick layout of the place. There are two huge hills on either side of the campgrounds with the campgrounds in the middle. On the first night, we went hiking in both mountains. 
And yeah, I say we because I was with two of my cousins and two of my brothers. On day one, we decided to hike up both hills, the taller hill first. Not all the way but high enough to find a good spot for a fire that wasn't entirely on an angle. It would be easier because the only plants would be brush and some ferns. But we had to climb on a fall but we had to climb over a fallen tree to get across to the other side of the river, which the shorter but more dense hill didn't have. Anyway, we hiked up through the ferns trying to mark the trees with our park trying to mark the trees with our pocket knife so we would have a good way back. So we find a good spot for a small fire, light it for a little bit and chat before getting super hungry and deciding it's time to go back. It takes maybe 20 minutes. We follow the makeshift markings, making our way back and climbing across the fallen tree. Our camp is just there. We eat, drink, and whatnot before going on to the shorter, more dense second hill. This had to have been one of the worst decisions of my life. We crossed a road and started going up. At first, it was just ferns, but then it quickly turned into some more dense, swampy jungle that became tormentingly repetitive and brutal. We were looking for just a small clearing for a small campfire and to sit and rest for a bit. But after about an hour of hiking up, I just kind of gave up and realized this wasn't somewhere we should have been going further upwards. It would be fruitless to continue. So after a debate with my brothers and cousins, we started to turn around. This is where things take a turn for the worst. After a couple of minutes in on the way down, we came across some sort of slight cliff or slope that we didn't come up from. We didn't recognize it. It sounds like there's almost a waterfall at the bottom. We could not see because it was dark at this point. This is when I start freaking out in my head, coming to the realization that we had all become lost on a muddy, swampy, jungle-like hill. And mind you, as I said before, we hiked about an hour up this hill. So we are easily hundreds of meters up, we all hit our panic, and went up a little bit, and turned left. After that, we walked over this hill for two plus hours before finally finding a small river that could lead us to the bottom. We follow it for maybe ten minutes before I see a flat dirt clearing, like it was a mini fishing spot or something. We decided to go across the small river and walk up a bit to check it out. Mind you, the whole time my group yelled at me to come back, and I'm glad I ignored them because the spot I had crossed over led to a dirt road. I had never felt so relieved before. I quickly screamed to everyone about my findings, and sure enough, after about a minute or two, we had come across a gate at the bottom of the hill, and we were now back at the camping area, all because of me. Imagine if I had listened to my group, ditched what I had found, and came back across the river. Now it gets even weirder, I kid you not. Not even a couple of minutes later that same night, as we were all muddy and sitting by the campfire, we all had seen what looked to be a UFO in the sky. My brother pointed up and said, The stars are moving kind of funny. At first I laughed and didn't think anything of it. Still, he said, No, really, look, dude. My cousin said, Yeah, the stars have been moving. So I almost broke my neck as I jerked upwards to see a freaking star spinning around in circles before shooting off into a straight line. It wasn't the only star to do that either. There was multiple of them, all in one night. And this wasn't the first time I've seen quote-unquote aliens, but that's just a story for another time. On the second night, we went across the river to our campfire spot to a more accessible hill, which only had soft ferns. Still, I was almost traumatized from the previous night. We went up and cooked some potatoes and tinfoil without incident, and that's all I can really remember. Thanks for reading my story. Mountain Encounter by Micah I'm 28 years of age and I live in Northern California. I used to love the outdoor activities like hiking, camping, motorbiking, and all that good stuff. I would always go to the mountains and especially the rocky places. But after the incident I had, it's time for a change. This is my story. One day, I decided to go motorbike riding up in the mountains with my two good friends Todd and Rachel. The hill we are going to is a well-established trail that most people know about and many people also go there. Todd and Rachel packed our stuff and gear and headed to the mountains. We only packed the stuff that we actually needed like a first aid kit, sleeping equipment, food, and water. After arriving, we parked our car and gassed up our motorbikes, preparing everything we needed. Rachel wore red clothing items with a red helmet. Todd wore yellow and I wore orange and we headed out. 
It was fun riding up and down the mountain slopes and down hills and meeting people along the way. When we got hungry or thirsty, we would just stop, chill, relax, and enjoy the time we had with each other. After our break, Rachel decided that she wanted to go alone by herself and she will meet us at the top turning point in the mountains. Then she rode her bike off and left. So it was just Todd and myself. We just rode our bikes for some time and did some sightseeing here and there. We talked about everything, like how Todd likes Rachel and, and how he's going to ask her out and all that good stuff. I was happy for Todd because I already knew he wanted to be with Rachel. Then we decided to head out to the turning point where Rachel said that she wanted to meet us and we would wait for her. Hours passed and there was no sign of her. People came by us and we would ask them if they saw a girl who drove around on a motorbike wearing red and they all said they didn't see her. It's been two hours since we got here and that's when we started to get extremely worried. So we decided to head down the mountain and look for her. It might take a while, but we will do whatever it takes to find her. Rachel is a good friend and we will never leave her alone. So we rode our bikes and traveled around yelling her name and asking people if they saw a girl wearing red and riding a motorbike. It was getting late and dark, so we headed up the mountain one last time and saw people walking down. We stopped and asked them if they had seen this girl wearing red, until an old couple told us that they had taken a picture with her earlier. The old couple said that she was heading down to the stream for a better look. After hearing that, Todd and I rode our bikes as fast as we could down to the mountain stream and followed it down. We found Rachel's motorbike and backpack when we got there. We searched the area and yelled out for her. Suddenly, we heard a woman crying and screaming not so far from us. We headed toward it and found Rachel crying and screaming, covering her face. So we came to her and comforted her. She was hysterical, shaking and crying. But when she stopped, she looked at us with the most significant, wide eyes that a human being should not be able to do. We were shocked, but that did not stop us. We carried her to our motorbike, and we were about to drive off when we noticed something in the distance. We both looked up and saw a little girl standing next to a giant oak tree, facing the woods. We were startled, but we kept on looking at the little girl. All of a sudden, she slowly turns around. We hesitated, got scared, and left the area. Days had passed and Rachel was hospitalized for two days. We didn't know what would happen to Rachel, but we stood by her side the whole way. Me, Todd, and Rachel never went to that area again, I can tell you that much. My True Creature Encounter by Vic75 when I was seven or eight years old, I had a disturbing encounter with some sort of creature or entity. I lived in the Appalachian mountain range of Pennsylvania. It was November, around when daylight saving time occurred. I remember it was supposed to be a school day, but since the heavy snow, the buses could not drive out in the morning, so school was canceled for a snow day. I was excited to spend the rest of the day in the snow. We had an acre of property going quite far back into the woods. I walked deep into the forest to a small frozen pond past my property line in the mountains. All of a sudden the woods went dead silent. No birds, no wildlife scurrying around, absolutely nothing. I remember thinking this was strange, but I kept walking to make it to the pond. I should have turned around right then and there, but I was a naive kid. After I reached the pond, everything was still completely silent and the hairs on the back of my neck felt like they were rising. I started to get frightened but I didn't know why. I felt like something terrible would happen to me if I didn't leave then, so I decided I was going to sprint back home. As I arrived in my backyard, I realized it was terribly late, and the sun was setting. My mom came running outside, asking where I was all day, and never disappear like that again, scolding me. None of this made sense to me because I had only been gone for like 20 minutes. I left my house with snow gear on at 10 a.m. right after the snow day call. It was almost 8 p.m. when I'd finally gotten home meaning I had been gone for 10 hours somehow. I have no idea how or what happened to me in those mountains. I remember only being out there for such a short period. I don't know if this was some sort of missing 411 type thing. Did I go through some sort of time portal? I don't know. If anybody has any idea, I would love to know in the comments though. Frederick Sound Experience by Menu Feeling 1577. 
When I was in seventh or eighth grade, thereabouts, our school had an early summer trip where they would take ten kids who signed up and four adult chaperones to keep them wrangled up in the Frederick Sound of Alaska for three weeks total. The trip's goal was to kayak to different wilderness beaches and to camp along the mountains. We left from Petersburg, Alaska by a small seaplane that flew us in fours out to our first destination which was a beautiful little bay cove area on an island that you could walk to on low tide. Behind the bay on the hillside was an evergreen forest that overlooked a beautiful set of mountains. By that point of the trip we would be on our own for the next two and a half weeks. It took about a half a day to get that done and the rest of the day to set up everyone's camps for the night. The first unusual thing we saw back up in the tree line from the beach when we arrived was old wooden ship parts. You could find ropes and pulleys thicker than our arms, old rotted pieces of carved planks and railings, and most interesting, a helm and its deck attachment. All these things are half buried in the dirt strewn across the tree line above the shore in a dire state of decay, but no sign of any other part of the ship. I don't know how long it had been there. I don't know if it was wrecked on the shore long ago or was wrecked at sea and chucked up onto the beach during storms, but it was eerily fascinating to all of us kids and we all brought up many wild ideas to what we thought it might be at the campfire that night. After all the others returned to their tents, the girl I had a thing for with at school and I stayed at the fire to talk and flirt. It was the perfect timing for it too. We listened to some humpback whales singing out in the bay, and we heard some wolves in between owl hoots from out in the very wild darkness. We had a starry night sky that looked out of a dream with a big white moon letting in a bright bluish light in between the trees on the shore. Both of us were finally getting tired around what must have been 1 or 2 a.m and we ran out of the easily found wood to chuck up on the dying fire. We headed back to our respective tents. The tents were set up in a line of trees, a line running from the beach into the wood. The girls' two tents were right against the sand. The chaperone's tent was a couple of yards away from that, and our boys' two tents were just a couple of yards further. We were the furthest into the wood. The moonlight made it easy for me to find my way back to my tent, but once I entered the tent, I didn't see where my new friend Alex was sleeping, and I accidentally woke him up. Now, Alex and I had just become friends on that trip. However, we did kind of know each other from some classes and in the hallways. We didn't really know each other that much. We just hung out in different social groups. We didn't hang out before this trip. He was an athlete and popular kid, and I was a skater band kid. Still, we both loved the outdoor. He asked me what the hell I was doing back so late and he was giving me a grin as I said I was still at the fire with Lisa. He immediately sat up and wanted to hear more. We were quietly giggling about girls and teenage boy stuff when the woods outside went dead silent out of nowhere. The kind of silence that gives you a sick feeling in your chest and throat and some sort of weird weight in your stomach. It's like the back of your neck starts to feel hot and a survival instinct is telling you that you're not alone in the wild. We both noticed it too. Everything fell silent. The only sound we could still hear beside the distant roll of waves was inside of our tent. Our other tent mate, Sam, had been there the whole time and was still snoring away like a chainsaw. Funny, right? Except we were more worried about why things had gone silent outside. We felt uneasy about it and decided to listen for a couple of minutes. And that's when we heard it. Now, the side of our tent with the door was facing toward the other tents and the shore. This noise came from the opposite side, the side of the woods. I kid you not, it sounded like a bunch of monks meditating and harmonizing on the word OM, but without saying the M part and continuing the prolonged drone sound. It moved from out of the forest to our tent. It started softly and far away and rather quickly but steadily became louder, which is how we realized it was moving closer. It sounded human, but there was no pausing for breaths or shift in tone for any known reason. It was something that I can't really explain. Suddenly the noise was outside the tent, and that's when we noticed even Sam had stopped snoring. As far as I know, he was still asleep, but his silence made the noise more intense. It circled us, no wavering or swaying of the noise. It just spun, seemingly suspended in the air, just a few feet outside of our tent at what I can only describe as a humanish height off the ground. 
We couldn't see through the tent, but the moon was still bright enough to see silhouettes of the trees outside. So, I would assume that if something solid were making it, it would cast a shadow from certain angles. Nope. No visible form was coming from this noise. No footsteps or twigs were snapping. Just the noise circling. At this point, Alex and I's heart were pounding in our throats, and we had the looks of terror on our face. We just kept silent and still listened. After it circled our tent, we heard it move closer to the other boys' tents and do the same, then down to the chaperone's tent. It spun theirs but sounded fainter due to the distance. It continued to the girls' tents where we could barely hear it over the sound of the ocean. For sure enough, it sounded like it stayed there a minute. Based on the current context most likely circling, then after a few minutes, we heard it slowly return in a straight line from the beach and pass us back into the forest where it faded and disappeared. A couple of minutes after the sound stopped, the nighttime forest noises returned, and even Sam started snoring again. Alex and I quietly said to each other, Holy crap, did you hear that too? Then we tried to go back to sleep, but I'm sure neither of us were very successful. The following day, we went outside and checked all around the campsite and couldn't find any sort of tracks or anything different from the previous night. Nothing at all. We asked if anyone else in the group had been awake and heard anything weird, and the response was no. We didn't go further into it with any of the others, but Alex and I know what we experienced. After the trip, he and I went back to not hanging out, but when we do see each other, we exchange looks of solidarity and know what happened, and we experienced something truly different that night. Camping in Romania by Anonymous. This is going to be a relatively long camping story told by someone who doesn't speak English as a native language, so be understanding. Romania is a country where people might get kidnapped, murdered, disappear, and such. So, yeah. My parents were legitimately afraid for me and against the idea of camping. I had to lie to them and say that we would stay in a hotel near the Cozia National Park so they would get off my back. That's not what we did. Okay. So long story short, we had to travel from Bucharest to the park, which is around a 200 kilometer drive, about two hours by train. We got our big backpacks and everything we needed and went our way. Nothing specifically happened on the train except for the fact that the train was overly crowded, with the exception of our train compartment being empty. That is extremely rare for Romanian trains. I got excited thinking that we have the whole compartment to ourselves. As I said, it is scarce... And, of course, after 10 to 20 minutes, it got occupied by a man entering our compartment, accompanied by a beautiful German Shepherd. I love all kinds of animals, cats and dogs in particular. I usually find my way around all animals, even those who usually don't like people. Not this dog, though. This dog was otherworldly. He looked so stuffed as if he were a stuffed animal himself. He would listen to the owner's every single command. I was impressed. So I asked the man about his dog since it would be a long and awkward trip in complete silence. The man was exactly like his dog except for the commands he would give to his dog. No other contribution to the conversation. He told me the dog's name is Yuchigushu, which is Romanian for the killer. I thought it was a weird name to give a dog, but I thought to each their own. I asked him why he had such a scary name and he said, This dog is trained to kill. It's the only thing he likes and he is good at it. Now I personally consider that the dog will grow up to have a similar personality to his owner and most of the time I would judge people with dogs and how that animal reacts to the world and his owner. And let me tell you guys, these two did not give a good vibe at all. I brushed everything over thinking to myself that maybe this guy was training his dog to hunt in the woods. Then I started thinking about which woods are legal to hunt in our country. While thinking of that, the guy out of nowhere asked us if we are traveling to the Cozia National Park. That was surprisingly accurate, considering the only time we mentioned the place was in the train station long before we found our seats and long before we even met this man. Again, I thought it was nothing because in my country people happen to go in the same direction will try to make small talk and guess where you are heading. Of course, you can just lie to keep safe of your destination or be honest if you want. Unfortunately, I took the honest route, and I'm judging myself for that hardly. Never be too open with strangers or honest after reading this story. It should be a warning. 
We confirmed we were going to the Kozia National Park and asked what else there was to see around there since he started talking about the area nicely considering we knew nothing about the site. We took it all in. He told us about the woods, the vegetation, and the animals we could encounter. He told us about a beautiful monastery right at the bottom of the mountain that we had to climb. He also advised us to check out the Lotri Shore waterfall and explore the caves behind it and try out the local restaurants. When this guy started talking about the wilderness and nature, his eyes glowed as if he was experiencing a pleasant memory. But he also grabbed his dog's collar from the neck, squeezing it tight. The collar made a loud clink sound. What surprised me was that the dog made no move, no whimper, no twitch, nothing. Just like a stuffed animal. Anyway, we reached our destination and said our goodbyes. The man waved at us, and we faced against him to go on our way. I turned around back right away because I wanted to ask where exactly that restaurant was and the man and dog were no longer there. Just like that, they were gone. That creeped me out a bit. We were too thrilled about the first camping experience to care though, so we started walking with our backpacks, 10 kilograms each, and we reach a tunnel digging into the mountain. It looked amazing, exactly like those horror movie tunnels which, if traveled during the night, would make your hair stand straight. Luckily for me, we traveled during daytime. It wasn't a long tunnel. We could see the end, but by the time we got to the middle of it, we heard a whimper in the distance. It sounded like a dog crying in desperation for its life. We stop and my boyfriend looks at me with this, oh no, you're not going to take that dog with us type of face and tries to convince me to take a different route. We don't. I hear the dog, I go right towards the sound, and in the middle of the road, I see a chubby puppy with lots of white and brown circles around its butt crying so hard laying on the cement as if it were hit by a car. I freeze and think our trip is over. I must save this dog. We call for him. He looks at us, pointy ears, gets up, and like a doofus, starts running desperately to us. He was alone and afraid. We called him Rudolph, and now he was our camping buddy. About a kilometer further, we find another puppy, probably his sister, which we dragged from the nearby river. Someone threw her in the river to kill her. All wet, cold, and hungry. Of course, we take her too. So here we are, 10 kilogram backpacks, each two puppies at our chest, a boyfriend with a map, and still trying to find a spot to camp for the night. We passed by the monastery the man on the train mentioned, but because we had these puppies, we couldn't enter inside the building. The priest would not allow us. So we just walked around the property through the gardens until we reached the base of the mountain we had to climb. I'd like to mention that these puppies were two tiny little brats because the second you put them down to force them to walk on their own, they would slam their butts on the ground and cry. So much drama. We walked and walked and walked until we decided to stop because it was getting late and I was beginning to get cold. We found a spot next to a small landmark cottage in the middle of the woods. We call it Troyanitsa. It's like a scouting post but for the church where they place religious icons or a bible. Inside, to bring good energy to the area, it belongs to the church. It wasn't like a house, and it has a roof with four small walls and an opening, not quite a door. You could go into it, to hide from the rain, but it really wasn't meant for that. There was an icon inside, and a Bible with pages ripped from it. Curious as I am, I opened the Bible and was annoyed to see people would write down their names in it as couples do on trees. But on one particular page, the words... I will find you stuck out. It was written in red ink. Again, I thought to myself that it was probably somebody who wanted to scare travelers with a silly message. I put the book back and gave it no second thought. We put up the tent, made the fire, unpacked, and made food to eat. We feed the puppies, which are now cuddled up in our tent, and finally darkness starts to rise around us. My boyfriend always kept the fire up every hour because when it went off, it felt as if all the sounds in the woods were louder and closer than they were in reality. Now it's midnight and we are all in the tent cuddling to keep warm. The puppies wake up and start crying. I get up to unzip the tent and let them out to pee. They do and I get them back in. They call some more and the smallest one starts shivering. At the same time, I hear grunting from behind our tent. My boyfriend is now up as well and he hears it. The fire is fading. The sound disappears into the woods when he unzips the tent and steps out. It sounded like a snake slithering through the fallen leaves on the ground, but with unimaginable speed. I ask him, what was that, a snake? He says up to this day he cannot explain what he saw. He said it was a slithery figure with feet that made a sort of snort-like sound when the light hit it. 
The puppies calm back down after this creature runs into the woods. We try to go back to sleep after we reignite the fire. It's around 3 a.m. this time when we wake up to the puppies being fussy again. The fire is nearly dead. We have no idea how to put up a sustaining fire, apparently. My boyfriend gets up and searches for firewood and I get out as well. I stare into the darkness and swear to God I hear whispers between the trees. I look up at the sky, considering it's 3 a.m., and listen to birds being very loud and fluttering their wings. Now, I'm no expert on birds, but don't they usually sleep around this time? Well, these birds weren't. They were very active, very vocal, and very frustrated about something. I look at the fire, follow the red sparks popping out into the sky, and become fascinated with something. The spark doesn't seem to die. It goes on and on, changing color from hellish red to green. This was very out of the ordinary because it created an illusion that was hard to explain. It looked as if the fire sparks were going into the woods, making a track for me, probably to follow. I kept looking after each spark to see when it burned out, and none of them ever did. They would levitate, turn green, and flow off into the woods. At that moment, I begin to get goosebumps on my skin. The birds are agitated, the mysterious light pointing us deeper into the woods, and all the trees around us have eyes on them like the trunks had a distinguished shape that looked precisely like eyes. I know this is nothing paranormal since someone explained that those shapes form when a branch is ripped from the root, which is the shape left after. But there were so many, like hundreds of eyes, all looking at the exact same spot where we decided to camp. Having only that religious tiny landmark to protect us mentally, and as I inspect my surroundings, I hear movement in one of the bushes in front of our tent, only about 10 meters away from us. I stand my ground but don't go near it. Suddenly a dark, bent-over silhouette comes out and half inside the bush and half outside, staring at us. I call my boyfriend and we're both like, what is that? Is it a bear cub, a wolf, a pig? The creature shakes its head the same way a dog does after a bath and I hear a distinguished clink like a dog collar. At this time my boyfriend manages to light up a fire, massively, lighting up much of the area. Apparently, it also scares this animal to run back into the woods through the bush. That calms us down, but not enough to ever close our eyes again that night. Going back into the tent, my boyfriend falls asleep and the puppies are sound asleep, but not me. I keep the zipper on the tent open just a little, just enough to have an eye peek through it. I think I spent a solid hour staring and falling asleep. Suddenly, I hear a noise coming from that direction and I immediately wake my boyfriend up who is now peeking through the hole in complete darkness with me. What we see next still haunts my dreams. From that same bush, we see a human head popping out and looking toward our tent. Note that our peeping hole was small enough not to make it look like you were being watched inside the tent. His head is slowly coming out of the bush, skin so white we thought it was a ghost. After that, a shoulder, another shoulder, an entire torso, and a leg. Bit by bit, as a whole man emerges from the bush, completely naked, lighted by the moon in our fire. What he did next was excruciatingly scary for me. He comes so close to our tent and begins to remove branches, rocks, etc. from our fire, extinguishing our fire by dismantling it. This is all happening at like 2 to 3 a.m., a couple of feet in front of our tent. I look at this man in horror because I recognize him, and now the clink I heard earlier from the animal is explained. It is the same man from the train, with his dog, too. I don't know if he followed us. I don't know if he just went the same route as us and found us and decided to stalk us, but this guy was there since midnight at least. Because our fire would be dead every two to three hours, the sound of cracked branches would wake us up and rocks being moved, which we internally explained to some animals crossing the land. After successfully putting out our fire, he slowly crept back into the same bush, submerging in it bit by bit, until only his head would be out, with a disfigured looking mouth, looking like a moaning ghost. You try to go back to sleep after that, I bet you you can't do it either. We didn't know what to do, so we just got back out, reignited the fire, lit ourselves some torches, and stayed near the campfire until the first rays of sun came up. I admit I fell asleep while sitting next to the fire, and so did my boyfriend, but any sound would wake us up immediately. I was far too scared to go near that bush, but I did not need any answers or any explanations. I was not curious to find out what that person was doing. The moment the sun rose, we packed all of our stuff and got the hell out of there. We planned a four-day camping trip, but this experience made us give up after the first night. It was a risk we did not intend to take. If that guy followed us or it was just a coincidence, it was enough to ruin it all. I don't know what they were doing. 
As a conclusion to my story and a piece of advice to any first-time campers out there, never tell your location or even areas remotely close to your destination to strangers. You don't know where their minds may take them and what they may end up doing. Always stay safe and always be aware of your surroundings and any changes that may come to you in the form of sounds, movement changes, and temperature, and so on. Always protect yourself. What Park Rangers in the Great Smokies Won't Tell You by Horror Writer 1717 I was a park ranger in the Great Smoky Mountains in Tennessee. It wasn't a bad job. The scenery was amazing. I loved to drive up Klingman's Dome Overlook and watch the sunrise. Anytime there was a thunderstorm, I headed for that overlook. One of the best things about the job is the autonomy. Being left alone to do whatever you want is kind of excellent, but it doesn't come without its downside. This park is massive, over a million acres and 11 million people visit annually. I found out the hard way why the park closes at night though. If you've never driven through the Great Smokies on a cloudy moonless night, you've never experienced true soul-crushing darkness. Do you know those extremely bright LED lights that so many trucks have on the front of their grill blind you when they drive towards you? Yeah. Our trucks don't have those. We have regular lights. The old, dull, yellow glow. The ones that make you wonder if your battery is going dead or if you'd be better off shining a flashlight ahead of you because you would probably see more that way. The AM radio in the Ranger truck spews out static-filled country garbage. It would be easy just to turn it off, but sometimes I feel like it's my only company on the endless black ribbon of road that runs through this sea of darkness. One thing this job gives you plenty of is time to think. And sometimes that's not always a good thing. I slam on my brakes to avoid hitting a deer. It glances at me, then continues to strut across the road in no hurry. You're welcome! I yell out my window. The deer doesn't even pause. I swear the animals around here think they own the place. <laughs> I think that with a chuckle. Just to make my life more interesting, it starts to snow. In ordinary places, that's not much of a problem. In this pitch black mountain, it could quickly become an issue. It usually doesn't snow here, but there's a call for concern when it does. Most times, it's a freak occurrence and comes fast and heavy. This time is no exception. Within minutes, the road is covered. Already low visibility has been reduced to nearly zero. And of course, it starts when I'm furthest away from the station, right in the middle of nowhere. I slow to a crawl, knowing it will take me forever to get back. But at least I'll get there in one piece instead of sliding off a mountain to my fiery, gory death. I hope... I turn on my windshield wipers in a futile attempt to keep visibility. They work almost as well as the radio, honestly. The defroster and the wipers fight a losing battle against the onslaught of snow. I would just pull over and wait it out, but out here I don't want to end up buried in snow for days waiting for someone to come plow me out. Each station has one snow plow. I don't remember when it was used last. Suddenly, I look out the front of the truck and remember that I am actually driving the only truck with the mount for the plow. Translation, I need to get back because there's no one coming to get me. As that positive thought rattles through my head, I come to a turn I see just in the nick of time. I have just enough time to wrench the wheel hard to the right and stay on the road. My tires and the deepening snow disagree on which way the truck is going and I end up sliding toward the edge. I jump on the brakes in a panic causing them to join the direction argument. In the end, momentum wins. I slide closer to the rail that I know won't keep me from diving hundreds of feet to my death. I'd love to say that my life flashed before me, but all I could do was see that damn snow. I'm going to die surrounded by irritatingly blinding white snow. With nothing else to do, I close my eyes and pray. Time slows as I begin to bargain with my maker. The usual stuff, I'll be better, I'll give my life to the church, I'll become a priest, a missionary, whatever you freaking want as long as you save my life. I felt a heavy thump. This is it, I think. I'm going over the edge. As a desperate last ditch thought, I opened my door and threw myself out into the road. I land hard, like a belly flopper on asphalt. The wind escapes my chest and refuses to come back. I lay there rocking back and forth in the cold on the white road hoping that by some bizarre twist of fate, someone else doesn't come along and run me over. Seconds turn to minutes as I lay there watching the snow in its relentless downpour, waiting for my breath to return. Eventually, I come around and painfully rise to my feet. 
The truck sits idling as if nothing has happened. I reach in and put it in park, feeling embarrassed and stupid for getting myself in such a panic. I grab my flashlight and go to the front of the truck to see the damage. I'm surprised to find the front bumper sitting four feet from the rail. I know I hit something, I say to myself, examining the fence and finding it undamaged. I turn the light to my bumper and find it's been bent slightly at the end. My light flashes back and forth between the entire guardrail and the damaged bumper. What the hell? As my brain wraps around this puzzle, another piece falls into place. I see patches of hair on the bumper and red in the snow. As I pursue the matter, I know the imprint of a large animal lying in the snow in front of my truck is probably not the best idea to investigate. I pull out my phone and take a picture. The impression it made was massive. This thing is at least as tall as the car is vast, even more significant. Great, I hit a bear. I say sarcastically. I sigh as I see the trail of red heading off into the trees beside the road. Guess I should go check on it. I return to my truck, grab my coat and the keys, then head after my quarry. The red is becoming difficult to track through the deepening snow. The tracks themselves seem odd. They're too close together. It's almost like as if this bear is walking on its hind legs. But why would it do that? Did it hurt its paw or something? I approach the edge of the woods, still following the red tracks. I don't want to go too far into the woods. I'm hoping I can catch a quick glimpse of the bear alive and well looking a paw, but otherwise okay. Trekking through the dark woods in a snowstorm isn't part of the plan to keep me alive long enough to retire. As I follow the tracks further, I notice something else about them. They don't look like bear's tracks. If I would say they look like anything, I'd say more like large dog tracks but they're way too big to be any normal dog I've ever seen. Even for a Malamute or a St. Bernard, these are massive. I step into the woods not intending to go much further, and a flash, and flash the light around a little bit. I notice the path continues going slightly uphill. <laughs> nope, I say. Not tonight. I turn and head back to the truck when I hear a low guttural growl. I slowly turn around and see red glowing eyes staring at me from behind a tree. I shine the light in the direction and see that there are tracks that lead right up to a tree that hides all but the eyes of this creature. It's massive. The eyes must be eight feet off the ground. I've never seen anything like this and I still haven't seen it. Just the eyes at this point. In my terrified stupor, I do the least likely thing possible. I pull out my phone and take a picture. The flash makes it blink but also appears to make it even more angry. It starts toward me. I would love to say that I was calm, relaxed, and collected as I returned to my vehicle and was on my merry way, but that didn't happen at all. I screamed and turned to run, but my boots were slippery and I fell, nearly hitting my head on a rock. As I gain traction and speed, I hear heavy footsteps behind me. No need to turn and look, I know it's coming after me. Oh dear god, oh dear god, oh dear god, oh dear god. I know I'm not going to make it. I do the one thing I don't want to do. I glance back. A massive mound of fur is galloping toward me, its red eyes glowing with malice. It's coming so fast that it'll overtake me at any second. No matter how fast I try to go, there's no way I'm going to get to my truck. My panicked mind runs through a myriad of options. From just give up to turn and command it to stop to throw the flashlight hoping it will fetch it and give you time to get inside the car. The moment of truth arrives. I'm almost to the truck but I can feel its hot breath going down my neck at this point. I'll never make it around the corner. I'll try to think back to all those dinosaur movies I've seen and how they escaped. My mind reminds me that many of them ended up as a dino snack before the film was done. I sarcastically thank my brain for the happy thought and chose the one tactic that the movies always seemed to show to be successful. I slid under the truck. I'm barely on the ground until I hear a loud bang. The car lurches to the side. A massive snout shoves itself far under the truck as it can and it sniffs. I try to ease my way out from under the car, but, but the nose disappears and reappears on the other side. This time, there are also claws pawing at me, trying to get a hold of me. I shimmy away from them, only to have them show up on the other side. Back and forth we go, like a demented seesaw. Front, back, sides, wherever I go, it's right there trying to grab me. After an eternity of this game, it tries something new. The paws disappear and I feel the truck springs compress. It's climbed on top of the truck. Shoot. Now can see no matter where I go. I test my theory by shining my flashlight toward the back of the truck. It instantly appears and tries to shove its snout under, snapping at me. I push further toward the front. It returns to its vanguard on top of the truck. 
I lay as still as possible for an eternity, trying not to move, barely breathing, hoping it will lose interest in me and return to the woods. My waiting game ends when I realize the snow is almost up to the level of the truck's frame. I'm going to lose visibility soon. I know I need to do something. I come up with a desperate and stupid plan. I shine my light at the back of the truck, causing the creature to jump down and claw at me. At the same time, I dig some snow away from the front of the car to regain visibility. Then I do the same in reverse. I shine the light at the front and dig at the back. Next, I execute the most desperate and stupid part of my plan. I threw the lit flashlight toward the front of the car and it bounces near the guardrail and, for a moment, it looks like it's going to hit and bounce back. I freeze in fear as it takes one more bounce then disappears over the side. The creature leaps down but doesn't shove its snout under the truck. It jumps the guardrail and disappears. I gasp in astonishment that my plan has worked. I lay there and marveled for a second. Then my mind kicks my ass. What the hell are you still lying here for? Get in the truck! I jump up hitting my head on the car's underside then roll up on the driver's side, yank on the door, and of course it's locked. I fumble with my key, just like I've seen in every horror movie ever. I wondered how those people could suddenly forget how to use a key. And now I know. After several failed attempts, I finally opened the door and threw myself inside. I started it up, slammed it into reverse, and hit the gas, and nearly did a complete 360 as the tires fight for traction in the snow that has accumulated around. I take a deep breath and compose myself before giving it a little gas, just enough to get moving and get myself back on the road. This leads me to my next problem. The road is gone. All that remains is a blanket of white. Sweat forms on my brow as I start down the road, steering by measuring the distance of the trees to the bank spot that used to be a road. I crawl down the mountain this way, slowing to a near stop whenever there is a curve. Unfortunately, it's the Smoky Mountain, so it's all curves. An hour later, I'm no closer to the station. However, a minor miracle happens. The snow stops. I'm so ecstatic, I'm nearly jumping in my seat. I might even make it home alive. I glanced in my rear view mirror and those hopes are dashed instantly. In the distance, I see glowing red eyes, and they are getting closer. My veins turn to ice as I press down on the accelerator. After sliding through a turn, barely remaining in control of the vehicle, I realize I can't outrun it. I slow, but only a little bit. On the few straight spots in the road, I speed up but then slow down when I get to a curve. Consecutive stretches are the only time I can afford a glance in the mirror. Each time I do, the eyes are still there and they are a bit closer. I inch closer to the station, clinging to the desperate hope that I can make it there before this thing catches and devours me. I look at my odometer and realize I'm only five miles from the station. It might as well be a million. I sigh. As I look back and see the eyes have become considerably more significant. There's a sharp turn coming up. I know I have to slow down for it. I know that things will catch up when I do. I also know there's a steep drop off at this turn. I'm stuck. No matter what I do, it's going to end badly. I do what has to be done. I slow down enough to keep from sliding off the edge. When I straighten out, I glance back and the eyes are gone. Could it have slipped off the edge? My hopes rise and then suddenly plummet as I see the red eyes beside me. The monster is running beside the truck. It slams into the door, making a considerable dent. It hits again and shatters the window. Its snout dives in and snaps at me. As the snarling, snapping jaws of a death inch closer, I duck and... As the snarling, snapping jaws of death inch closer, I duck into the passenger seat. I do the only thing I can think of. I slam on the brakes. The unprepared monster goes flying forward as I slide to a stop. It shakes itself and stands, growling at me and baring its teeth. I jump on the gas pedal to get as much speed as possible to run it over. The truck leaps in the air as the tires pass over the massive monster. I don't slow down until I have to. After I make it through the curve, I look back and don't see the glowing eyes. I hazard a glance out the window and see nothing but snow. I can't trust the quiet. I'm so paranoid, I'm shaking, and at this point I think I'd rather see the blasted beast just to know where it was rather than this ungodly suspense. After a few minutes and many more glances back, I finally let myself relax. I'm only a mile away from the station, and I can't believe I made it. The truck explodes from impact. I feel like a bulldozer has rear-ended me. I wrestle with the steering wheel as I'm hit again. The car is moving faster even though I'm standing on the brakes. I look back and see the monster. It's pushing me. I look forward and see the guardrail crumple underneath my front bumper. The truck slides over the edge. It's not the steepest ravine in the park, but it doesn't need to be. The, the car falls end over end and then starts turning and rolling. It all happened so quickly I never took the time to fasten my seatbelt. I'm thrown around like a rag doll. By some miracle, I stayed inside the truck. I don't know how long I was unconscious, but I woke to heavy footsteps and snarling. 
I'm lying sideways under what's left of the back seat. The truck is on its roof and I'm lying in a puddle of glass and blood. The monster sticks its snout through in the shattered window and leers at me with its glowing red eyes. I try to crawl away, but my leg is bent at an unnatural anger, probably broken. Pain shoots through me as I try to use my arm to push out. Ultimately, I realize there's no escape. No fight left in me, I lay there and waited for the inevitable. It sniffs at me and drool drips from its mouth as its putrid breath assaults me. This is it. I close my eyes and wait. Nothing happens. I open my eyes and it's gone. I painfully turn to see if it's playing some game, but I can't find it. What the hell happened to you? Says one of my fellow rangers as he sticks his face into the window. How is all I can manage? Looks like you're about to be the luckiest son of a bitch I've ever seen, he says. You must have rolled off the road up there and landed on this road down here. A few more feet and you would have been headed for another tumble. I lay there waiting for something else to happen. This is a dream, I think. I'm dreaming of being rescued while the monster chews me into pieces. Let's get you to a hospital, the ranger says. I wake up in a hospital bed. My right arm and left arm are each in a cast. It hurts to breathe. I'm pretty sure there are some broken ribs. The door opens and another ranger steps inside. I see they got you all fixed up, he chuckles. What happened to you out there? Did you fall asleep at the wheel? I think about what I should tell him. I wonder how much he would believe, and then I remember. Phone, I rasp. He reaches into the pocket and pulls out his phone. I shake head painfully. No, my phone. He searches through my bag with all my clothes and pulls out my phone with several cracks on the screen. Pictures, I rasp. He opens the screen and navigates to the pictures. He looks at the last one and says... Well, ain't that something, he says. I'm so glad he sees it. I can tell my story and have proof of everything I see. He turns the phone towards me. All I see in the picture is white. The flash was on. The snow wiped out the monster's image. He scrolls back to the other view of the creature's imprint, but the flash in the snow also washes it out. I'm devastated. I know what I saw and I know it's real. Isn't it? I turn away. I'll let you go so you can rest up, he says. Then walks out the door. I'm not crazy, I saw it. A month later, I'm feeling a lot better. My arm and leg and ribs are all on the mend. I filled out my accident report. I didn't mention anything about a creature. My slipping caused a crash of the snowy road. And that's how I left it. I wish I could say that I've improved mentally. That I have had less nightmares. That I don't look out the window every night and see glowing red eyes staring back at me from the woods. But I can't say that, because it would be a lie. I know it's going to hunt me down one day. I know it's waiting for me. I used to be a park ranger, and I discovered something disturbing in the woods. By Horror Writer 1717 I'm sharing this as a warning. There are things out there that you don't know about, and you don't want to know about them either. Stay away from them. Don't go looking for them. I'll tell you my story in hopes that it will quench your curiosity. It was a night just like any other night. At least, lately. I had barely arrived at the ranger station and we had four calls of vacationers' homes that were getting broken into. Here in the West Virginia Wildlife Preserve, people think that just because they plant some houses, the animals should know how to respect boundaries. That's tough when the animals were on a massive plot of land where they have never been hunted or threatened by anything other than a giant animal. Folks seem to think this is a great vacation spot for them. They don't realize it's also a great vacation spot for the animals as well. I hopped in the company truck and started toward my first destination of the night. An elderly couple had been terrorized by a deer that apparently broke through a sliding glass door. They managed to trap it in a side room and needed help releasing it. I got elected. When I got there, the vacationers looked like the ones caught in the headlights. They were still wide-eyed, and I could tell they were in some sort of shock. I had to get them into another room and close the door. Once they were out of the way, I found the closest entrance to the outside and opened it. Then I went to the room the deer was in. I slowly opened the door and was shocked to find the room covered in blood. The deer was lying on the floor panting. I approached it slowly, circling to open the doorway, hoping to give it an escape route. The closer I got, the more I realized this deer wasn't going anywhere. Its side was covered with claw marks. At first, I thought and pondered that potentially a coyote had attacked it, but the effects were far too devastating. 
They were large enough to be caused by a bear, but the individual claw marks were far too apart. I'd never seen anything like this. If I had to compare it to something, I'd say Freddy Krueger sliced it up. When I approached it, the deer's eyes went wide, but it didn't jump up and run. I took this as a bad side. Its breath came in ragged gasps as I struggled to roll it over. Once I did, it was my turn to struggle to breathe. Its entire side was torn to shreds, but that wasn't the worst part. There was a large chunk that was missing. I examined the wounds and found a bite mark where the missing flesh should have been. But the bite marks were massive. If it didn't challenge the claw, if it didn't challenge the laws of nature and my sanity, I would have said a shark bit it. But blood poured out of the side and the deer struggled to draw breath. I stood and left the room, leaving the poor creature to have some sort of dignity in a private death. When I went back in, it was still. I took pictures with my cell phone and tried my best to carry the creature out without making much of a mess. After loading it on the back of my truck, I went back inside and talked to the vacationers. When I opened the door to their room, the woman's eyes grew wide and she started screaming. The man's eyes were the size of saucers as well. I approached them slowly with my arms outstretched to try to calm them down. It seemed to have the opposite effect. They started climbing the furniture and clawing at the walls to escape me. I decided to back away and give them some room. What's wrong? I said. The man pointed a shaky finger at me. You, you, you're covered in blood, he said. The deer got you, the woman said. You've got rabies or, or worse, the man said, keeping his distance. <laughs> I'm sorry, folks, I said. This is the deer's blood. You killed it just for breaking in, the woman said. No, it was already injured. I just took it to my truck. The couple seemed to settle down and considered this. So you don't have rabies, the man said, slowly looking me up and down, or anything else, the woman said hiding behind her husband. No, ma'am, I'm fine. She took her turn eyeing me up and down, I assumed looking for wounds. Satisfied, they asked me a few questions. So, what killed the deer? The man said. I actually have no idea, I said truthfully. Having just gotten them calmed down, I didn't want to send them back into a panic with some sort of conspiracy theory. It was probably just a coyote, I said. A coyote, the man said, diving back into the pool of panic. Or a bear, I said, trying and failing to calm them. A bear, the woman said, diving after her husband. You know, folks, you've had a traumatic night, I said. I can't tell you what to do, but if I were you, we're leaving, the woman said, dragging her husband out of the room. That sounds like a good idea. I said, and then, like an idiot, I added, I hope you enjoyed your stay. They either didn't hear me or ignored me. Either way, it wasn't long before I heard a car start and roar away from the house. I went back into the room where the deer had been trapped and started working backward, trying to find out just what had happened. It wasn't hard to pick up the trail. It had been bleeding badly. Seeing the bites and claw marks made that fairly obvious. I tracked back through the kitchen and through the smashed glass door. Once outside, I turned my flashlight on. The trail was a little hard to follow outside, but not too much. I could still see drops of blood beside its tracks, and I followed them back toward the pond behind the house. I approached the pond and saw signs of a struggle. This must have been where the deer was initially attacked. There were other tracks with the deer, but they didn't make any sense to me. They were large, much too large to be any animals I knew. Their shape was odd as well. If I had to call them anything, I would have called them duck prints, but massive. More significant than any duck by any means. A giant duck with shark teeth. I think I'll leave that out of my report, I thought to myself. It suddenly struck me that the tracks were potentially a man with swim fins on his feet. But why? Why go through all that trouble to poach a deer when you can just knock it out with a tranquilizer gun? My mind sent me an answer, but I didn't like it. What if the man is a psychopath, just getting his kicks off by killing animals with his bare hands? I thought about that. There is a mental hospital in the neighboring county, and I wondered if maybe one of their patients had taken an unsanctioned leave of absence and was trying to keep it quiet. I didn't like the thought of that at all, actually. Aside from the fact that it didn't really explain the huge bites on the deer, it also meant we had someone who might suddenly get a taste for killing humans. Doing this to animals was horrible, but what if he decided to do something... bigger? I looked at the house, wondering how many vacations were within a short walk from this spot and how many were harmed. As I contemplated the safety of the people in the area, I heard something behind me. I whipped around and shone my light but saw nothing. I scanned the pond and saw a few ripples emanating from the middle. Probably just a fish jumping. 
I took some more pictures of the struggle area on my phone and then started tour by truck. I had more calls to answer, and this riddle would have to wait for now. I drove away and went around the lake, around three miles away, to the other vacation home where a break-in had been reported. When the woman in her thirties answered the door, she stepped back. Uh, oh my, she said, looking at the dry blood all over my uniform. Good evening, ma'am. Sorry about my appearance, I said. Did you report a break-in? Yes, we did. Please come in, she said in a friendly tone, yet gave me a wide berth while closing the door. She led me upstairs to the kitchen. For some reason, I was expecting to find blood all over her, like the last house. For some reason, I was expecting to find blood all over, like the last house. However, this was a completely different mess. She showed me the door. It had been forced open, but not shattered like the last one. There was also only a tiny amount of glass broken. Then the door latch was unlocked, and the door slid open. There were three faint images of giant duck tracks, just like the last house. My spine turned to ice. This house was over three miles away from the other. Many more people in that space might have fallen victim to this crazed person or whatever. The woman showed me the rest of the kitchen and the mess that was left. A few cans of sardines and some cans of tuna fish had been opened and eaten. The strange thing was how they were opened. The cans had been torn into with something sharp but not a can opener. The marks looked like they were torn open with claws. I shuddered to imagine the amount of strength it took to do something like that. And then I spotted it. Beside one of the cans was a small puddle of blood. Ma'am, could I trouble you for a sandwich bag? I said. She handed me one and I carefully tried to scrape as much blood into it as possible. I sealed it, put it in my pocket, and then went to the broken door. Behind the house, just like most of these vacation houses, there was a pond. I traced the tracks to it and they disappeared at the water line. I shone my light over the water, but the only thing I saw was a stray turtle. I stared at it for a long time as though it would give me a clue about what was happening. What should we do? The woman said, nearly scaring me half to death. I hadn't heard her follow me out the door and into the yard. I'll send someone around to look at the door in the morning, I said. In the meantime, it might not be a bad idea to sleep in a room with a door lock. I'm sure they won't be back, but just in case. She didn't seem very comforted by that idea, but thanked me as I left. The following two reports were just teenagers breaking in and stealing beer. That was it. No bloody wildlife, no weird tracks, just kids being kids. I returned to the station, changed out of my bloody uniform, and spent the rest of the night filling out reports on what happened. When my shift was over, I passed on what had happened, I took a little trip to the neighboring county, I stopped at the mental hospital and asked if they had any recent escapes. The nurse looked at me and I asked her if she was wearing deodorant. We don't have escapes, she said with evident pride that showed some arrogance. I then turned left feeling less than satisfied with her answer. Next, I stopped at the local police department and asked one of my friends in the force if they could analyze the blood sample for me. I thought there might be an escaped resident from the mental hospital, and the blood sample might help us find out who it was and track them down. It was well past noon until I got to bed. The night when I got to work, it was pandemonium. There had been more break-ins and people were panicking. The owner of the resort was frantic. People were canceling left and right and wanting their money back. He stormed his pudgy face right up to mine when I walked in. You told people to go home? He fumed, glaring up at me. I merely suggested, do you want to pay their rental out of your salary? I work for the state, not you, I said. He turned a deeper shade of red. Would you rather see people in body bags instead of animals? I said. That wouldn't do much for business now, would it? He turned the fire engine red and stormed out mumbling. We'll see. I investigated five break-ins that night. Only two of them were legit. The rest seemed like half-hearted attempts to stage a break-in so they could get out of paying for their rental. The two real ones shared the same characteristics as before. Just enough of a broken window to open the door. The cans of whatever seafood was available. They even got shrimp out of the freezer. Everything about the way the intruder acted pointed to a person. All I needed to know was who it was. Again, I followed the tracks back to the nearby pond. I stood for a long time studying the surface of the water. I knew these ponds were all designed the same. A roughly 40-yard body of water, around 5 feet deep in the middle, stocked with mostly bluegill for catch and release fishing. Anyone using these ponds to hide would have to be holding their breath for inhuman periods. I stared at the surface for 20 minutes. If someone was out there, they had an invisible snorkel or an extra set of lungs. After my rounds of investigating and reporting, I decided to stick around to do a little bit of extra investigating. I ran home, grabbed my swim trunks, mask, and snorkel, and went to the site of the most recent break-in. 
I waded into the water, unsure of what I would find. When a snake slithered past me, I let it go and waded deep enough to where I could swim. I hovered at the surface level, dipping my mask under the water to get a glimpse of whatever there was to see. There wasn't much, fish, underwater plants, and a lot of water. Just what you would expect from a pond. As I kept going towards the middle, the water was getting deeper. I now couldn't touch the bottom. I had to float to the surface, looming in front of me was a dark spot at the bottom of the pond. I took it for a rock, but swam close enough to investigate anyway. In for a penny, in for a pound. As I drew closer enough to hover over it, I realized it wasn't a rock. I took a deep breath and dove down to find out what it was. The further I swam down, the different I could swim down. I kept going and going. Light disappeared. I was sure I had been swimming straight down for a solid minute without touching the bottom. I turned and looked up. The surface of the pond was only a pinprick of light. My lungs screamed at me to turn around. I had no choice but to comply. I clawed at the water in desperation. It seemed like I was swimming in mud, or something was pulling me down. Almost like a force of current pushing against me, wanting me to go down before I could finally explore this hidden secret. After an eternity, I broke the surface of the water and gasped for air. I swam over to the shallows and walked out of the pond. I collapsed on the shore and laid there for a long time, trying to regain my breath. As my brain received oxygen, I thought about what had happened. Maybe it had been some sort of illusion, or maybe I had just gotten turned around and somehow stuck at the bottom. I had to find out. I wasted no time driving two countries over and renting some dive equipment and light. So, armed and ready, I returned to the pond and walked over to the middle again. This time, when I dove toward the dark spot, I could see exactly what it was. I used the flashlight and examined the darkness. As I swam more profoundly, the sides closed in on me as if it were going down into like a fish's gullet. I had never been claustrophobic before, but that was rapidly changing. I barely had any room to maneuver as the sides closed in. I contemplated turning around, but there was no room. I could feel myself start to panic. I had to focus on keeping my breaths regular. I was very close to a panic attack when suddenly the tunnel opened up again. The sides grew further apart. I checked my watch and I had been only here for about 15 minutes. The sides of the tunnel had spread out so far they were barely visible. I could see the light ahead of me. I swam toward it, desperate to get out of this water. I broke through the surface looking around I was in the pond. Somehow I had gotten turned around and was back in the pond. I swam to the side until I could stand and walked out onto the shore. Looking around, I made a startling discovery. I was in a pond all right, but it wasn't the same pond. It was a different pond from one of the break-ins. Somehow, there was a hidden tunnel between the two ponds. That's how the robber never gets caught. He swims to the next pond, slick as snot, no fuss, no muss. I now knew the how, but I still needed to learn more. As tempting as it was to swim back through that tunnel, I was still a little shaken and didn't want to risk any sort of underwater panic attack. I walked back to my truck, took off my diving equipment, and drove back to the dive shop. I asked about frequent customers, especially for refilling air tanks. They told me they had a few regulars that came in every weekend, but no one knew, and no one who refilled more than once a week. I asked if there were other dive shops in the area, and they told me the next closest one was about 100 miles away. I went home frustrated. It wasn't making any sense. He would need air to swim back and forth through the tunnel, which was his escape route. I was sure of it. I tried to sleep through the afternoon, but my mind wouldn't let me rest. It was working at an impossible puzzle of how a robber was getting air. I borrowed a couple of trail cams and set one up at each pond. I needed to see if he had some new tank system or something. I also wanted to identify him and shut him down fast. I made sure to stay away from those ponds that night so he would feel free to do his thing. In the morning, I gathered the cameras and took them home. I downloaded both memory cards before watching the video. Just as the second download was finished, my phone rang. Hello? I said. Hey John, it's Steve. I got the results in that blood you gave me the other day. Great, I said, hitting the play button on my computer. Were you able to get a match on any hospital records? Um, not exactly. Why not? I asked as a ghostly green image appeared on my computer. The image was blurred, but it was the size of a man walking upright toward the camera. I clicked on the next slide and froze at what I saw. Well, the blood you gave me came back as reptile DNA. I registered the words he said in my mind, just like I registered the image on my computer screen, but I couldn't place them in reality. Are you there? 
he said into the phone. Yeah, I'm sorry, I said. Can you send me a copy of your findings to my office? Sure, no problem. Thanks, I appreciate it. You helped me figure this out. Anytime. He chirped before hanging up. I hadn't taken my eyes off the computer screen the entire time. No matter how long I stared at it, I couldn't make my mind acknowledge it was accurate. Standing there, large as life, was not a man in a wetsuit. It was a creature. I could see the wide mouth full of sharp teeth that looked precisely like the bites in that deer. I could see the webbed feet that looked like swim fins. And they had claws sticking out from the front where the toes would be. I saw the razor-sharp claws on its webbed hands. It was a full-on nightmare staring at me in the face. I sat back and thought for a long time. Then I printed copies of the images and put them in an envelope. I rushed to the station to share my information with my fellow rangers. As I was showing them, their faces ranged in emotion from shock to disbelief to outright mocking. As I went through my investigation, the timeshare owner walked in. What are we all looking at? He asked, eyeing me contemptuously. It seems like John has solved the case of the break-ins, one of the rangers said. The owner approached. He picked up the lab report and read it, then stared for a long time at the picture. Do you know what this is? He said absently. I don't know yet, I said. I've never seen anything like it. He turned to me and smiled. This is money, he said, holding up a picture. What do you mean, I said. Those idiots that go around hunting, what do they call them? Um, cryptids, yeah, cryptids. They'll pay through the nose if they think they can find something like this. And then there's the TV shows and merchandising, he said. You have saved my financial hide. He beamed at me. I don't think you understand, I said. This is a dangerous animal. If you had seen what it did to that deer... So what do you want to do? Hunt it down and kill it? Maybe. Not kill it. Tranquilize it and take it to a secure location where it can't hurt anyone. You dumb son of a bitch, he yelled. I could make a mint. I wouldn't even... I wouldn't even have to repair those houses. They would all rush in to investigate and leave piles of cash in my bank account. But what about the people? Who cares about the people? He said. Throw them all out. I've got the chance of a lifetime beating on my door. And you want to flush it all down the toilet because you're scared of someone breaking a nail? He was breathing hard and staring up into my face. The air was charged with fury, his and mine. And then a sudden calm came over him. Charles, he said, addressing the lead ranger. Isn't this a wildlife preserve? Yes, yes it is, Charles said warily. And aren't the wildlife on this preserve protected from all tampering by law? Well, I guess so, Charles said. What if those animals present a threat? I said to Charles. How many deer were killed by a coyotes on this preserve last year? The owner said. Dozens, Charles replied. Were the coyotes removed from the preserve? No, Charles said. The owner turned and shot me a triumphant look. John, Charles said. I know you have everyone's best interest in mind, but you're gonna have to let this go. I glared at him. And what happens when this thing decides it likes to eat humans all of a sudden? All the eyes in the room on me suddenly found somewhere else to walk. All but the owner. He was smiling ear to ear like a chubby little freak he was. It honestly looked like he was about to break into some sort of happy dance. I searched the room for any support but found none. I pulled the badge off my shirt, quietly laid it on the desk and left. If that were the end of my story, I would, I would say I had failed. I took my pension and rented one of the houses on the preserve. The owner had leaked through social media that a cryptid had been spotted on the preserve. As he had guessed, the cryptid hunters and TV crews came in droves, renting everything in sight. My goal was different. I already knew it existed. I learned how it got around without being detected. I stayed at one of the break-in houses. Every night I took a giant tuna I had bought fresh that morning and laid it outside next to the pond. I sat in the dark living room and watched the first night as it approached the fish with more caution than curiosity. After sniffing at it for a long time, it grabbed it and dove for the pond. Each night after, I laid out a fish and the creature became less cautious. It was being fed, and the media frenzy was starving. The hunters had found nothing. There were no sightings as long as I provided it. Everyone had their cameras set up. A few who roamed around left me alone and then they saw someone in the house. I guess they thought I was another cryptid hunter and respected my privacy. As the number of sightings stayed at zero, they started turning on the owner, calling him a fraud. His reputation was plummeting. After a week with no sightings, people began leaving. In desperation, he did the wrong thing. He hired an actor to dress in a creature suit and roam around. Of course, the hunter's show saw right through this and destroyed what was left of his reputation. 
I rented the house for two weeks. Between the rent and the fish, my money was running out quickly. I had to keep the people safe, but what would happen when I stopped feeding them? I managed to clear most of the people so they would be safe, but what about my fellow rangers? What would happen when it came desperate? When the starving creature no longer had houses full of food to break into? I had three more nights until I had to leave, and then I would be out of money entirely. The preserve had become... The preserve had become a ghost town. As far as I knew, I was the only renter left. It was finally decision time. I sat staring at the giant tuna on the table with a bottle of bleach. Let it live and see what happens, or kill it. I thought about this for a long time. Both options had merits and consequences. I chose the third option, a much more dangerous one. I took the fish out, laid it where I usually did, then backed up a few feet and stood there. Over an hour had passed before the water stirred. I saw the head and eyes of the creature appear as it headed toward the fish, and then it stopped. It had seen me. I made sure to keep still with my arms at my side. It slowly approached and stood. It was a few feet away from the fish in between us. It studied me and sniffed the air, then became agitated. Perhaps it had smelled my scent before as a pursuer. It let out a soft hiss, bent down, took the fish, and kept its eyes on me the entire time. Then once it had its meal, it did the most incredible physical display I'd ever seen. It leapt twenty feet into the air and landed perfectly, right in the middle of the pond before leaving no splash and diving away. I let out a breath. I didn't realize I'd been holding and collapsed to the ground. I was shaking. Once I had recovered, I went back inside and fell into a fitful sleep. That was the only part of my plan. The next night would decide who lived and who died. I did exactly like the night before, minus the fish. The creature approached, stepped up to me, and looked around for the fish. I showed it my empty hands. It sniffed them and growled. Having smelled the scent of fish, it looked at my hands and I wondered if it would bite them off as a substitute. It hissed at me and hissed at my face. I saw it flexing its claws the whole time. I stared into its face, those massive razor-sharp teeth and swallowed hard. I did all I could do to stay still, to show that I wasn't a threat. My heart hammered in my chest. It opened its jaw and showed me those horrible teeth. Its breath was a horrid stench I had never smelled and hoped to never again. I closed my eyes, not knowing if they would ever open. Seconds fell into minutes and I opened my eyes and was alone. There wasn't even a ripple in the water. I sighed, my decision had been made. I had shown restraint and... I would like to do the same. I went back inside, packed, and left. I could only hope and pray that the remaining people, including my former co-workers, would be safe. I went home and slept restlessly. In the morning, there was a report in the newspaper on a break-in at the wildlife preserve. The only thing that was taken were cans of tuna fish. I smiled ruefully and wondered how long it would stay that way. If you're reading this, don't go looking for this thing. If you see it, please don't tell others about it. Just leave it alone and hope for the best.